Genesis chapter 40. After this, the king of Egypt's cupbearer and his baker offended their master, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard assigned Joseph to them and he became their personal attendant. And they were in custody for some time. The cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, each had a dream. Both had a dream on the same night and each dream had its own meaning. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they looked distraught. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were in custody with him in his master's house, why are your faces sad today? We had dreams, they said to him, but there is no one to interpret them. Then Joseph said to them, don't interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph. In my dream, there was a vine in front of me. On the vine were three branches. As soon as it budded, its blossoms came out and its clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand and I took the grapes, squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. This is its interpretation, Joseph said to him. The three branches are three days. In just three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your position. You'll put Pharaoh's cup in his hand the way you used to when you were his cupbearer. But when all goes well for you, remember that I was with you. Please show kindness to me by mentioning me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. For I was kidnapped from the land of the Hebrews and even here I've done nothing that they should put me in the dungeon. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was positive, he said to Joseph, I also had a dream. Three baskets of white bread were on my head. In the top basket were all sorts of baked goods for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. This is its interpretation, Joseph replied. The three baskets are three days. In just three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from off you and hang you on a tree. Then the birds will eat the flesh from your body. On the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, He gave a feast for all his servants. He lifted up the heads of the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position as cupbearer and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker just as Joseph had explained to them. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's an outline there in your newsletters and there'll be an opportunity, God willing, for questions at the end if you've missed out in any of our series. Uh, We're working through Genesis over seven or eight years. Uh, They're all online, usually Sunday afternoon. The videos or the sound recordings are there on our website. Uh, Let me begin with a question. I think this is actually the question this passage asks us. How do you interpret life? How do you interpret life? What framework do you use to make sense of the world around you and your experiences in that world? And we all have a way of interpreting life. We all have a framework for making sense of the world we live in, the events and the experiences and the world we navigate. And it's actually pretty important for us as God's mob to spend time thinking about how we make sense of the world. What framework do we use? It's an important uh, question, (coughs) excuse me, on a macro level. How do I make sense of this drought? How do I make sense of that fire? How do I understand this war or that cultural movement or this political event? That's important on a micro level. How do I make sense of this relationship at school, that workplace decision? This moment of loneliness, that day of elation, that time that seems so amazing or perhaps so miserable. How do you make sense of life? I suspect Joseph had plenty of those moments to reflect on, didn't he? To ask that question, to make sense of the world he's living in. And I think he makes a statement in Genesis 40 that helps us understand how crucial God is for making sense of life. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. 
Thank you for how familiar it is, but thank you, Father, for how you often apply it to us in an unfamiliar way, in a way that brings us face-to-face with who we are and face-to-face with who you are and face-to-face with this world. Father, please do that today by your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm at point two on the outline. Uh, We're in a section of Genesis from chapter 39, verse 21, through to the end of chapter 41. That's really just one big section, but to fill a preaching roster, I've broken it into three. Uh, It's really one section that's got to hold together from beginning to end, and it's dominated and explained by two phrases. Uh, The first is the one that Dan helped us understand last week in chapter 39. If you've got your Bibles there, 39.2, verse 3, verse 21, verse 23, the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him. We're reminded that everything happening to Joseph is within the Lord's understanding and presence. And Dan actually helped us remember last week that the name used for God here is really important, isn't it? See how it's there in your Bibles, all capitals, L-O-R-D? That's the personal relational name of God that he gives to his mob that he's committed to. God's made a covenant. Remember that word? A binding agreement with his mob. A covenant with Abraham's family. And through that family, God has said he's going to do something to the world. I'm going to reverse the curse. I'm going to bring my approval to the world. I'm going to bring my blessing. God's committed to that promise. And he's committed through every generation of Abraham's family, Abraham to Isaac to Jacob and now through Jacob's boys and in particular Joseph. Dan helped us remember last week that this is by God's grace. Uh, Joseph is a snot when we first meet him, isn't he? He's a rat bat. He's a typical boy who's got dreams and aspirations and he wants to tell the world how important he is. And so he does with his dreams, doesn't he? which immediately gets all of his brothers offside. But there have been changes in Joseph up until now, but not to the point where he deserves anything God gives him. It's all by God's kindness. It's not as if God looked down and went, oh, there's a spark of potential in that young man. No, no, there was nothing to recommend Joseph to God. In fact, that's the case right throughout every generation of this mob. Who was Abraham when God spoke to him? He was an idol-worshipping old man who couldn't have kids. Who was Isaac? A weak and a vacillating man who looked after number one. Who's Jacob? He was the second-born, scheming, grasping son. Nothing to recommend this family. And as we've heard time and time again, they're completely dysfunctional. And yet the Lord's with them. And the word used there in verse 21 of chapter 39 is really important. He extended kindness to them. He extended hesed, faithful, committed, unending love that displays God's commitment to his promise. It's the summary word for God's conduct in the covenant. Hesed, kindness, relentless faithful love and so the Lord never neglected or abandoned Joseph or the family of Abraham and so that phrase that first phrase that binds this whole section together helps us understand what's happening to Joseph in jail is he alone he's not alone is he the Lord was with him and extended kindness to him thrown into jail point three on your outline false accusation The Lord remains with him. And what happens to him in jail? We saw that at the end of chapter 39. Just like he was in Potiphar's household, he's given a level of authority and responsibility that's remarkable to the point where the warden just pretty much lets the jail operate under Joseph's authority. Doesn't worry about any of the decisions. And then two players from Pharaoh's court arrive. Verse 1 of chapter 40. After this, the king of Egypt's cupbearer and his baker offended their master, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard assigned Joseph to them and he became their personal attendant and they are in custody for some time. Once again, Joseph 
is given a position of authority. Once again, Joseph is connected with Pharaoh's court. Once again, Joseph builds a relationship with someone close to power in Egypt. Once again, Joseph is provided for by the Lord. Now, if you think parish councils can be a place of political intrigue, it's got nothing on Pharaoh's court. Uh, Pharaoh's court is a den of iniquity and debauchery. And these two people who controlled the flow of food and information to the ruler of the greatest nation of the world, these two men are crucial to that. And we don't know why they're there, whether he burnt the bread or he chose a wrong vintage, who knows? But what we do know is when it comes to palace intrigue, these men are central and they're on the wrong side of Pharaoh. And now they are in jail and they now know Joseph and Joseph knows them. After some time in custody, we'll come to time in a moment, both men have a dream on the same night, although the dreams are unique. And those dreams have an impact. Look there in verse 5. The cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt who were confined in the prison each had a dream. Both had a dream on the same night. Each dream had its own meaning. When Joseph (coughs) came to them in the morning, he saw that they looked distraught. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were in custody with him in his master's house, why are your faces sad today? We had dreams, they said to him, but there is no one to interpret them. In a culture where dreams were seen as a visitation from the gods, yeah, when you fell asleep, the gods visited, and they did so in dreams. Dreams are significant. Dreams are important. These men are vulnerable and have been visited to their understanding, by the gods, and they don't know what to do with it. Literally, it has made them sick. Joseph comes in and he notices their appearance. Do you notice this is probably not a question Joseph would have asked 11 years ago? He's now been in slavery and prison for 11 years. When we left him, when he met those brothers in the paddock, I don't think he would have asked this question, would he? (laughs) He wouldn't have cared about those around him. He was looking after number one. Notice the change as the Lord was with him and extended kindness to him. These men are vulnerable. Their dreams are obscure. They have a desperate desire for an explanation that deals with that knot in their stomachs. And Joseph is concerned about them. We had dreams, they said to him. There's no one to interpret them. Then Joseph said to them, Don't interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. The explanation of dreams in Egypt was a pretty important science. It involved numbers and dice and patterns and entrails and instruments and tools. You needed experts to deal with this. It was a really important science. And notice how Joseph speaks plainly. No science. God interprets. No science. It involves a relationship with God. I don't think we grasp how confrontational such a statement was. You guys are going about the world in the completely wrong way. The way you make sense of the world doesn't work. Only God interprets. Understanding reality is not a matter of formulas. It's not a matter of magic or delicate sciences. It's a matter of knowing who? God and understanding his nature. But making sense of the world is not human-centric, it's theocentric. It's got God at the heart and him alone. That's our second important statement for this section. And it's actually the application of our first statement, isn't it, if you think about it. If the Lord is with his mob, If the Lord is committed to his promise that he's made in grace to his mob, if the Lord is committed to reversing the curse and restoring this broken and damaged world, if the Lord is both the creator and the saviour of the world, then who makes sense of the world? It's got to be the Lord. The Lord alone is the interpreter of the world we live in and how his mob are to make sense of it. And so Joseph invites these men, point five on the outline, to share their dreams with him. The wine taster goes first. 
In my dream, there was a vine in front of me. On the vine were three branches. As soon as it budded, its blossoms came out. Its clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. I took the grapes, squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. This is its interpretation, Joseph said to him. The three branches are three days. In just three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your position. You will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand the way you used to when you were his cupbearer. Notice how definite Joseph is. Not, you know, possibly in three days, maybe four, could be five. I don't want to be too precise. Uh, There's this eventuality that might happen if you... No, notice how definite he is. This will happen. This will take place. Oh, the bread bread maker, he's really excited at this point, isn't he? In verse 16, uh, when the chief baker saw that the interpretation was positive, he thought, I want a bit of that. So he said to Joseph, I also had a dream. Three baskets of white bread were on my head. In the top basket were all sorts of baked goods for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. This is its interpretation, Joseph replied. The three baskets are three days. In just three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from off you and hang you on a tree. Then the birds will eat the flesh from your body. Both men will have their heads lifted up, one to serve and one off his body. Notice how definite Joseph is in his language. And did you notice the bit I missed out? Because sandwiched between these dreams and their interpretations is a very human request from Joseph. Look there in verse 14. But when, not if, but when all goes well for you, chatting to the cupbearer, remember that I was with you. Please show kindness to me by mentioning me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. For I was kidnapped from the land of the Hebrews, and even here I've done nothing that they should put me in the dungeon. To the best that we know, Joseph knows the Lord is with him. Joseph has grasped that the Lord is committed to him. And so do you notice that Joseph actually applies the second statement here in his own life? How's Joseph to make sense of this? Well, when this happens, please remember me. Joseph actually interprets the world around him through the Lord being committed to him. And the language of Joseph, as we've seen time and time again just briefly, the language of Joseph is revealing. He speaks as a man with certainty. How can he do that? Because of those two principles. The Lord is with me and the Lord alone interprets. How did this situation emerge? How did it come to be that I was in charge of the two key players in the palace and tree? How did it come to be that The Lord gave me an understanding of these dreams. It's only because of the Lord. And so he applies those truths and it takes place. The readers can't miss it. Verse 20, on the third day, not the fourth, not the fifth, not the second, on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he gave a feast for all his servants. He lifted up the heads of the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position as cupbearer. He placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand, but... He hanged the chief baker just as Joseph had explained. Who makes sense? The reader can't miss it, can they? The Lord makes sense of the world. The wine taster's head is lifted up, he's restored. The baker's head is lifted up and off his body. We can be in no doubt about how this happened or what it reveals about the Lord. He makes sense of the world. And Joseph has experienced and demonstrated this. And as readers, as God's mob who've received this text over generations after generations, that truth is unavoidable. And what happens to Joseph? The chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. Uh, He stayed in jail for another two years, point six on the outline. 13 years as a slave and in prison, unjustified. What does Joseph learn? (laughs) The Lord was with him and extended kindness to him. And the Lord makes sense. This covenantly committed God 
has promised that he would reverse the curse for the world through Abraham's family and bring it to every generation and every nation. And by the time we get to the end of Joseph's story, what is happening? Exactly that. As all the nations stream into Egypt where Joseph is now in charge to be spared the effects of a famine. That covenantly committed God has promised that he will save his people and the world from slavery and bring them to live with him. And he does that by Joseph being in Egypt and God then saving Jacob's family out of Egypt. As Joseph sat there for those 13 years in slavery and in jail, the Lord was with him and extended kindness to him and the Lord interprets. That's a pretty grim place for Joseph to be thinking that, isn't it? But in three years' time, Joseph will be in a really glad place. Does he neglect those statements? No, he doesn't, does he? He holds on to them in the grim place and in the glad place. These truths hold. The Lord was with him and extended kindness to him. And the Lord interprets. And I reckon when we look at Joseph and we see how he applies that, he's got a very clear structure as he does it. He remembers and he returns. He constantly remembers what the Lord has done. Constantly remembers how the Lord has never neglected him. Constantly remembers that he doesn't deserve it. Constantly remembers that the Lord is covenantally committed. And then he returns time and time again to that Lord to make sense of the world around him. He remembers and he returns. Those truths don't change for God's mob. Whether it's a grim place or a glad place, those ideas don't change. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and he told the disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. Taking along Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed and he said to them, my soul is swallowed up in sorrow to the point of death. Remain here and stay awake with me. Going a little further, he fell face down and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. He asked Peter, So couldn't you stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake and pray so that you won't enter into temptation. The spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, a second time, he went away and prayed, My father... If this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. He came again and found them sleeping because they could not keep their eyes open. As Jesus prays in a grim place, he remembers, doesn't he? His father hasn't neglected him. His father is there with him, the covenantally committed God. And as he prays in that grim place, who does he return to to make sense of the world around him? Whose will? The Father's will, which makes sense of what's about to happen to him and what he's committed to. It happens again for Paul, another man who is in a grim place. Well, we don't want you to be unaware, brothers, of our affliction that took place in the province of Asia. We're completely overwhelmed. Has anyone had that experience? Completely overwhelmed, beyond our strength, so that we even despaired of life. However, we personally had a death sentence within ourselves so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a terrible death and he will deliver us, not if, not possible, not maybe, he will deliver us. We've placed our hope in him that he'll deliver us again. As Paul recounts, he remembers He remembers the evidence of God's commitment to his mob. God raised Jesus from the dead. How present and committed is the Lord. And as Paul recounts that, he returns to that truth so that he trusts in the Lord to make sense of the world around him. Joseph displays a template for God's mob. It is a template departed from by Adam and Eve and every human being since but it's the template of life lived as God's mob. The Lord is committed and his commitment is the lens through which we make sense of the world. Now, I I hope you notice what it doesn't do. It's not a magic formula, is it? (laughs) Where was Joseph in verse 23? Forgotten, in jail for another 
two years. It's not a formula for a successful life. It's not a formula for a life where all the hardness of a broken world is whisked away. No, it's a reminder of the time frame of the Lord's commitment. 13 years a slave and in jail. Remembering that the Lord is committed and that the Lord makes sense. Is that the way we make sense of the world? Is that the framework we use, we remember and return? Or do we remember and return to other truths, other aspirations, other expectations? Now, I'm going to be blunt. I am not going to give you an application that's going to work through all of your life situations at this moment. Because all of us are different, aren't we? Some of us will go to Monday and be in a playground at recess or lunch. Some of us on Monday will go to a workshop as an apprentice or overseeing a number of people labouring on machinery. Some of us are newly married or long married. Some of us are widowed or widowers. Some of us are single. Some of us are retired or have a young family. Some of us are a young man trying to work out how to lead his family and some of us are a grandmother trying to learn how to relate to grandkids. Some of us are actually interested in the wider world and some of us just want to stay within the council boundary. We're all different, aren't we? And so I'm not going to give us a detailed application because we'd be here by lunch and we don't have enough sausages. But in each instance, the template remains, doesn't it? The Lord is with me. And the Lord interprets, remember and return. In fact, God's given us all of the resources to do that. He's given us his word bookended by prayer. And it's freely available. He's given us his community where we read his word bookended by prayer and return and remember. Joseph's template reminds us of the commitment of the covenantal God to his mob to reverse the curse of sin, a commitment that works towards the restoration of the prayer of that first man in the grim place. What was his name again? That was Jesus, wasn't it? Joseph's template asks us, as one of God's mob, is this how I make sense of the world? Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, Thanks for Joseph. I thank you that he remembered and returned. And thank you, Father, that you proved your covenantal commitment in his descendant, Jesus Christ. Father, thank you that this is not just the template of people, but it's actually the template of your son who prayed that prayer in Gethsemane before he brought to fulfilment your commitment. Father, as we go out into the world on a macro and a micro level, help us to think about the way we make sense of the world. And Father, as your people, return us to these truths. You are covenantally committed and you are the one who makes sense. Father, we see this in Jesus. Please help us to apply it daily. In his name we pray. Amen.